The presenter will be uh, Carola Baukold. Um, Carola Baukold is a person that I've been knowing for many years, uh, particularly in the 1980s uh, when we lived in the same city and uh, also um, went to the same uh, music academy. She was uh, a few years before me. Um, but still, we, uh, I had the, the chance to also attend uh, quite a number of events that, that she organized. And I, I remember one remarkable event when she was using a gestural or, or doing a gestural piece using um, uh, fly traps. Um, so this was a, as a, a piece where that, um, you know, that um, opened up a door for me for uh, a, a kind of um, control of musical and not only musical parameters, which, um, uh, you know, I had very little experience with. But I would like to um, um, uh, also to tell you a little bit about her uh, biography. Um, Carola Bockholt was born in Krefeld, which is a, a town in North Rhine Westphalia. And uh, after working at the local Krefeld theater, uh, Marienplatz for several years, she studied composition at the Cologne Music University with Maurizio Kagel from 1978 to 1984. She co-founded the Termchen Music Publishers in 1985 and six years later, the Termchen Ensemble. Hello, Carola. Hi, uh, Georg. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much yeah. for letting me. I'm right in the middle to, uh, of uh, presenting your biography and I'll have you take over from there. Um, she has received numerous prizes as, as such as the Bernd Alois Simonet Scholarship from the city of Cologne, a residency at the Villa Massimo in, in Rome and many other prizes. She's also been teaching as a guest professor in Europe, South America and Asia. In 2013, she was elected as a member of the Academy of the Arts in Berlin. And in 2015, she was appointed professor of composition with a focus on contemporary music theater at the Anton Bruckner University in Linz, Austria. A central theme of Bockholz's work is the examination of the phenomena of perception and understanding. Her compositions often blur the boundaries between visual art, uh, musical theater, and concert music. She's especially fond of using noisy sounds, which are often produced by unconventional means. It's important to note that these noises are not just part of a, some kind of predetermined compositional structure, but rather they are carefully studied and left free to unfold and develop at their own pace, lending the composition their unique rhythm. Carola Baukold will be presenting a pre-recorded video due to the instability of her internet connection, but will be available in person during the Q&A session. So please welcome Carola Baukold. Thank you very much, Georg. I'm really happy to join your great conference. Thank you. So please note your question or whatever, um, write it in the chat or that we save it for afterwards. And I think in 46 minutes, we will see each other again here. Yeah. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. With this lecture, I would like to give you some examples how to notate scenic elements in composition. This is still an interesting topic, like notation in general, because the notation is connected to the central idea of a piece. And this is so interesting to see in the notation Beside the practical needs, of course, we have to communicate what the performers should do with our notation. And with scenic elements, it's a challenge. Scenic composition, what does it mean? It means that visual elements are treated like musical elements. The energy and meanings of visual elements are composed like in music. Visual elements become musical elements. For example, instead of a flute, you have lights as a voice and it's composed like a counterpoint. 
could be composed like a counterpoint. The musical ideas expand on visual ideas and include them to a whole composition. This leads us back to the roots, to Mauricio Kage, who was one of the first who did it, who really composed scenical elements. I studied with him from 1978 to 1984 in Cologne. As a teenager, I performed some of his work in theater, Theater am Marienplatz in Krefeld in my home city. This theater is still alive and has performances every week, every Friday night. And there, with 16 years, I was able to play Cage, Kagel, Stockhausen, Beckett, Jandl and whatever. And this was, of course, a huge impact on my work. Here you see the piece Repertoire from Staatstheater from Mauricio Kagel. From him, I want to show you a very early work from 1963, Phonophonie, for two voices and other sound sources. I like that title, that title. Here you see an example from the second movement. And you see in the first stave is written this kind of speaking voice of the singer. High, middle, low as usual and the phonemes in German. Then you see movements, very schematic, so left shoulder high, head on the right side, right shoulder high. So he really precise notate what the performer is doing and what he's focused on. He wrote all movements should be together with the vocal sounds. In the breaks in between, freeze. So it's very, very clear to read. Then you see Licht, the lights. Uh, the performer is in the middle of the stage and the light comes from right and left. And you see the two tapes. Um, he only notated the length of the tape and the starting position. In the next page, you see another stave, the second stave, which is the singing voice. Interesting, he didn't write a key because it could be performed by male or female. And the last stave, you see the second voice, which is behind the stage. And this is interesting. I think it could be done by loudspeakers, so pre-recorded, but he did it to have it played together because at that time click track doesn't exist. And it's very interesting acoustically too to have loudspeakers, pre-recorded material and invisible live voice. It's kind of something you didn't get when you have it, this piece performed. This piece should be performed more. This early piece, because I, for me, it's so interesting that he doesn't make a list of possibilities, which he's doing in Acoustica repertoire. In many pieces, he's just doing a list, Staatstheater, of possibilities. And it's, uh, the order is free to choose. And this early piece was composed in the whole um, form and how we de deal with the scenic 
possibilities. Another composer who works with scenic elements is, was Dieter Schnebel. He wrote this huge works Körpersprache, body language and Zeichensprache, sign language. And he was really into how is it possible to notate these scenical elements. For example, a later composition, poem for one jumper. You see again, the stage is a sketch from the stage, a person in a small light field in front of the stage. Then you see what happens, which kind of movements happens. And the notation is divided in four lines. The bottom is the voice. So a scream when you jump on and a scream, yes, when you land. The other stage means the ambitus of high. So the upper stave is the head, the next the hip and the third the floor. So he was very interested in the high of the height of the movements. Here in the first page you see um, this ho ho ho, this uh, what the voice is doing and what the jumper is doing and the Tempi, of course. Here everything is in sync. Uh, second movement is kind of running, right, left, right, left, right, left. Everything is kind quite down and the breathing uh, line. And in the third movement you see again very high jumps and the vocal attacks which came later and later and later together. So he really played with what happens when the cry is coming with the movement or after or before. And this is kind of the focus of this piece. It's the reduction of bodily and vocal attacks and how they influence each other. Now I do a huge jump to my work, which of course is based on this older works. I did a series called In Gewohnter Umgebung, in familiar surroundings. The first one is percussion, Du duo with objects. The second one is a music theatre piece with five performers and clarinet, cello, piano. And the third one is cello, piano and video. It was my first video work at all. Here I was very interested in that the video is perceived as a musician. So this piece should be perceived as a trio. The music expands into visual. And the setup is the piano is looking at the screen, cello, that you really have a trio like in chamber music. So the play with the medium I really wanted to create a very close connection that everything is influencing each other. So I did a fake influence that the sound brings the video into vibration. I filmed a cup of coffee on a wooden chair and I played with a super ball underneath the chair. Then I put the sound away from the video and gave the piano the job to wrap the Super Bowl on the piano. And you get the impression that this sounds 
brings the video into vibration. Um, then the video sound, you see video image is the first line, video sound the second line. And there comes a very sharp water jet from the top. And this noise is stopping the live music. And here I created a contradiction between image and video sound. So you see a scissor is cutting paper. And with the movements of the cutting, you hear again the sharp water. The musicians are kind of doing ambience sound. Then the person is reading, thinking, writing, and with the writing, you listen to water. So the thinking, the flow of water, writing, and then she looked in the camera and she said, no, but you hear the water again. So, by the way, this piece was commissioned, commissioned and written for Elena Andreev, two French people, she, uh, for the cello and Françoise Rivalon. And she invented a new instrument, uh, Esperou, she called it. Uh, which is kind of sitter symbol or so, but it exists only once in the world. The original version is for this Esperu and cello. And later I did a uh, adaption for piano. So the piano part is quite percussive. So this is because they are speaking French. And so she says, no, you hear water and the live musicians are reacting, reacting annoyed to the video person. And the video person, Francoise, is speaking Sepadrolavi, what means um, life isn't funny, isn't it? And music is going on, reacting kind of what is happening. I show you an excerpt of the middle.
dire, eh bien... Hein ben... Here you see that I not only composed the interaction between video and music, but also the interaction between the persons, the interaction between musicians. In the next example, I will show you my piece Hellhörig. Um, Hellhörig has a double meaning. It's really a keen ear, attentive listening. And at the same time, it means when a flat is not is badly soundproofed, if you listen what the neighbors are doing. So this piece is about listening. And because listening is the main focus of this piece, I was only focused on sound production. And no cynical elements are composed, almost, almost no, none. So the cynical dimensions comes from the production of sounds. For example, I have an instrument like a tub of zinc. And when you drag it on the floor, of course, with a lot of rosin, then it produces a wonderful sound like a foghorn. And when a percussionist, here you see Dirk Rothbrust, is dragging this, of course it gets a cynical dimension. The whole body, how he moves and how he pro is producing the sound, is, becomes a meaning. It happens with any instruments, of course, but on a violin player we are used to how they move. But with unconventional instruments, it gets a scenic dimension. So for this, I have a normal music score. And I really was connected, uh, interested in the connection between the sounds. So you see the percussion one, he is, has a hemisphere of styrofoam. And inside a rubber ball is circling. And in the third bar, he is disturbing the circles. The rubber ball falls. The celli, so and then he is doing accelerando, accelerando. At that time, the celli are doing, imitating a melody of a steel ball, which is circling on a cookie tin which comes later. So this is an anticipation, the end of the section. So the topic of this part is circular movements. And in the last bar, the piano is doing very a disturbance. So dump hits on the metal braces of the piano the percussion dump hits on the wood and the singers are doing multiphonics with very loose vocal cords. And this is like a glissando, like a machine who, which is coming into movement, the sounds of the singers. And percussion four, he has a glass marble in a big plastic uh, bucket and turning this, circulating this glass marble very fast, it creates a huge crescendo. And the climax is with a jelly, which have the seagull effect. And they are doing a big rallentando, which is ending in percussion one, who is playing the steel ball on the cookie tin. And with these movements of the steel ball, the jelly get the melody. 
and then you noticed that the melody of the steel drum is the same melody the jelly are doing. Here's the example of the first performance. Okay, here you see that the scenic elements are not composed, but it gets a scenic dimension by the special instruments and by the musical interaction. In the next example, you have both. You have special instruments and composed scenic elements. This is written for Schlagquartet Köln. And I, I'm always fascinating how musicians communicate in making music, how they organize it to play together. So I took the bodies and the look. So the bodies, uh, I go back, the instruments are Gore-Tex jackets. Sometimes clothes can be so loud. And the Gore-Tex jackets has to play, be played on the body. It's the best possibility to play on a jacket, to wear it, of course. So it's uh, played with telephone card or fingernails or fingers, very simple. And I composed where they look at. So the notation is quite of easy, conventional. For example, the first line, you see second bar, both shoulders up, meaning, I don't know, and down. And then slapping on the hip, right hand, left hand, 
brush. Wipe the palm and this circle means look at play of four. And you see play of four at the same time is doing the same thing. Look at player one. The second player is doing in the third bar, for example, the eyes. Look into the public at player three, public, player three, public. The player three is doing the same one eighth later. Look to player two, public, two, public, two, public. And this becomes a rhythm together one and four audio, two and three video. You see this example and this page is coming at the end of the example. So I show you what is before and you see as in the notation, the focus of the piece is the interaction. It's a central idea, the interaction only done by the look, the sound and some gestures. Yes, you see the percussion quartet Cologne. This was the first performance in Hamburg by Feldmann, Brigitte Feldmann. Uh, on the left, Boris Müller, Achim Seiler, Dirk Rothbos and Thomas Meixner. The next example I want to show you is the piece OIC. For two balloon players, Clarinet, cello, piano, and video again. So I was thinking a lot about the project projection of video, how to make it connected with the sound. And I choose two big balloons. By the way, they were, I used the preparation of Michael Meyerhof because it's a fantastic idea. And these two musicians are playing this balloon with wet fingers and sponge and so on. Uh, the piano is in the middle without lid and the clarinet and cello is kind of um, right and left. And I want to create kind of a face. So I was really interested. This is a version of Ultima Festival um, with Ensemble Asa Misi Maza. This piece was written for them. And the central idea was what happens when a face is staring on you? What happens with our thoughts? So I built a face and the face is 
speaking in form of music. So what is the faith thinking? How do we perceive that? How the brain functions? And I'm very interested in the irrational side of our mind always, because I think music is the best medium to come very close on what is happening in our brain. Very, very interesting. So as you see, I took it very, very literally concrete. You see with your eyes, the eyes, you listen with your ears, the sound. The notation is conventional, I would say. The first two states are the video. For example, the first line, the left eye is looking slowly to position five, which means like in a clock, 5 p.m. Then suddenly into the audience, staying into the audience and blinking. Then slowly the lid is getting down half. With this half lid, the eyes move slowly to position three, looking to position three. And this is the right eye has its own system too. I thought the video could be performed live with a controller played like a musician. <clears throat> but it was so difficult to do, to do it in time, to control the controller, that I did a pre-recording pre myself um, to have it really in rhythm, which is very important in that piece. And because of that, it only works with click track, unfortunately. Then the second, uh, the, the second and third stays are the balloon player and I notated uh, with words and high, low, what they are doing. It is hard to explain, but so it's necessary to use text. Clarinet is conventional, piano and cello. So next page, you see they are playing gaffer tape, the um, instruments. And this is kind of a rhythm virtuous um, visual video part. Of course, the rhythm is the thing which brings everything together. And in this repetition bar, you see clearly connections. So the cello is doing a pizzicato and it's very important that the cellist is looking at the eye of the video. Because the eye of the video turns to position four where the cellist is sitting. Then the clarinet is playing, looking at the eye and the eye is reacting, looking at the clarinet. And then they are doing a thing together. So I played with the possibility that the sound is active, the eye is reacting, or the eye is active and the sound is answering. And all possibilities in between. The whole piece is built that a long section is only music and no video because it was really necessary to establish the balloons as instruments because you can't see the playing. It's behind and here you really know and learn which sounds are coming from the balloons and then suddenly the eye is awake and sleeping again and then there is a play with the eye and the musicians 
and in the last third of the piece it's kind of transformation to another thing irrational sight mm, i show you an excerpt from this middle section the play between the medium media and this is the first performance again unfortunately the cellist is not in but it's very hard to make video documentation of this is so important to be live in this situation sitting there being confronted with this face which is looking at you Yeah, so I would like to say that notation is so dependent on the idea, so there is no way how to notate. We always have to invent the notation new with every new media, for example, and ideas. We have to find new ways to notate what we want to have, what, uh, to notate our ideas. And sometimes conventional notation doesn't work anymore.
So you noticed very clearly that the sound comes from the sucking air of the tube and the sucking air is reacting very, very sensitive on what happens inside the mouth. Every very tiny change of the tongue or any muscle change the sound of the sucking tube. And I mixed with this the voice because then interferences changed the sound too so it's really very very uncontrollable and any uh, notation would disturb the performer really needs to be focused exactly on the sensation what is happening with the tube and the mouth so I notate the piece because, yeah, of course you could do improvisation, but how to build a dramaturgy and how to build a piece with this material you can't shape. This already is uh, an impulse, uh, very um, inspiring me. How is it possible to get control on something so weird <laughs> so i found little words like keywords um how the piece is built up and i described the technique what she is doing and what the sound should which sound should result for example the second one the lawn mower it's find a good tone and let it develop on its own. This is so important in this piece because um, the resonance, find the resonance of what is happens in the moment. And then lawn mower plus singing and um, this, yeah, follow what is happening with this and then it develops to didgeridoo techniques, so a kind rhythm. I wrote a bit pitches, so the fundamental is B and C sharp, and you can reach different registers, you can control the register, but it's very, very difficult. Here you hear more. Um, and again, in this piece, the Seneca power comes from the sound production. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. And now I think we have good time for your questions and I will get to you live now. Thank you very much, Carola Baukold. So we will now welcome you in person.
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm really there. <laughs> so you put on the same shirt? Uh, yes, of course. Same lighting. <laughs> it should fit. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing presentation. So I'm sure that a lot of people have questions. So I would like to open the Q&A session. Yeah, so I already see a lot of people with their, their hands up. Uh, Lorenzo, or Lorenzo, I think it's a set in Italian, right? Lorenzo Romano, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Carola. It was really incredible presentation, and I really like everything that you said. And um, I have a question about uh, the control of uh, particular sounds. Of course, last piece, last piece that you showed, of course, needs uh, a new writing. But uh, in a Hell Horik, for example, there were this uh, ball with this ball that is turning. And I wanted to ask you how much easy was or how much hard was to control and to write about, because it's not so easy to, to calculate exactly the, the motion. And uh, yes, I think it's very interesting because it's, of course, Everything is so well written and so precise that I want to ask you, how did you? Yeah, uh, thank you, Lorenzo. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, uh, I love to work together with percussionists because I, I really work on sounds. And it, um, you might see uh, the problem was that the ball fall and he uh, cut made an extra high that it doesn't fell out. So it's a lot of trying out and optimizing the sound. And this is a huge work. And often I go to the musician uh, before I finish the piece or sometimes before I write just to try out the sound. And um, yeah, so optimizing and controlling sounds is a, a long process and a huge part. So let's say at the end, you can control the duration in a really, really precise way. Yes, a mu musician do it. They, it's, yeah, it's sometimes a wonder. <laughs> oh, I course. can't do it. I can't do it with the vacuum cleaner so well, but uh, yeah. For example, this instrument in El Horiga, I think must um, needs some time to to, yes. to, so it's of course a, a, it's a compositional idea then because it's completely different from the gaff uh, that is percussive. Yeah, it needs time. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Next person would be Mieko Kano. Please, Mieko, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for the presentation with so much um, sincerity and integrity. I really appreciate it. Now, my question is related to music notation, the theme of this conference. Now, as you said, it's difficult to notate what you want to express and you try to invent, you need to invent something, how to notate every time. Now, from your presentation, I understand, and for you as a art music composer, it still remains significantly important for you to present your music in a notated form. Now, my question is how, I mean, with what sense of responsibility, well, or well what, what responsibility do you feel you have in notating ideas as art music composer? That's my question. And I ask this question in the context today where notation I, I, I mean, where um, somehow uh, the sonic, the any sonic information is seen as secondary to the visual information. And given that 
so-called music is so much about in the sound and you cannot touch it and so forth that music notation still has a, a, a major significance as the most representative form and visual form of our art that is art music um so given that context um yeah i, I i'd like to hear uh, from you in your own words <laughs> what what significance you attach to this um uh, this this interface notation as as an art music composer thank you yeah it's a very good question because uh, to notate is such a uh, heavy work <laughs> And I have the feeling it's kind of my job, even when I improvise with the musician and we try out together, sometimes they are doing amazing things. And I ask myself, is it really necessary that I write it? Um, and I think in future, I'm completely open to every other form uh, because many, many works today don't need such a kind of notation or find their own ways. Uh, but for me, it's, I know the, there is the idea. And when I start to notate, I have to be so precise in thinking. <laughs> and of course, it affects the composition a lot. So I think I would say it's my style. And for me, it's kind of important. Uh, uh, but I can imagine every other forms. Uh, so to have it like this, of course, it's my generation, future generation, find other uh, things. So I don't think it's really necessary to go on this way. Everybody has to find a new way to shape music or music theater or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question? I think there are so many interesting aspects in the work of Karola Baukolt, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I've been only hearing two questions. Yeah, Celine. Yeah. So, hi, Karola. Hi. <laughs> so, for the last piece, La vacuum leader, uh, still now, till now, you cannot find notation for it. Is it so? Yes. As I show, notation is no more possible, and I used words because this was the only solution for that piece. And, and then, yeah. yeah, excuse me, then for another prayer, another musician. Um, uh, it's a kind of possibility to use another words, not just this described you show us for the, the, how how they can train, be trained or yeah. So yeah. Uh, fortunately, we have these uh, videos today, yeah. and it's ha so helpful that they see it and they hear it, and um, yeah. So. I did, did it with these words, and I think it shows what mm -hmm. direction uh, I want to, and that's the piece. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, also okay. ask something. Uh, I'm still wondering, so the, the vacuum cleaner is on, the motor is sucking, and how did you make that we don't hear the motor? Yeah, I choose a special instrument, Miele Silent, <laughs> and you have the mic microphone here. Ah, it's close ah, up, okay. yes. Yeah, so you do, you you won't listen it. It doesn't disturb, and this Wonderful. is quite loud. What the sucking noise is is quite loud. So it's a really cool instrument. And I really enjoyed your presentation, showing the score and explaining it detailed, and then you really can receive it. I thought I know you, but now I know yeah. you much better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For my feeling, it was so slow. It's yeah. really another tempo. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Very okay. inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm just realizing it's already two minutes past seven and our concert is about to start. I would like to thank Carola Baukot very, very much and uh, 
and I hope that we'll be uh, still in touch. And see, please send my regards to Johannes. And uh, yeah, and maybe you can, uh, maybe you you'll feel feel enticed to to uh, you know to to listen to you know uh, to our concert tonight, or maybe to other um, um, you know um, presentations or uh, workshops that we may have uh, until tomorrow. Thank you so much, Georg. Yeah. All the best. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. bye.